I believe that every movie adheres to the 29 point story structure. No matter if the writer outlines first or if they dive in blind, the end product follows the same 29 beats. Judas and the Black Messiah is my 40th piece of evidence. This movie's been on my radar for a little bit, yet Twitter polling placed it front and center by a super majority vote. And I learned early, trust film Twitter when they agree with each other, a rare enough occasion. This tragic biopic is a cinematic masterpiece and has proven itself a masterclass in storytelling. Shaka King's painter-like shot composition and breathtaking camera movement are simply inspired. The music elevates every jaw-dropping performance, and the dialogue drips with character and reality. And the whole film is tied together by a tight control over the 29-point story structure. Let's begin. A tight focus on the core elements of the protagonist's personality, inner conflict, and situation. We meet Bill O'Neill, car thief with a fake federal badge and real huge cojones, and the prospect of prison hanging over his head. Where, why, and how the protagonist exists in their world, with a focus on why they don't quite fit in. Fred Hampton espouses the concerns and solutions to the anti-black authority in America, which has snagged O'Neill in its clutches. And to his recruits, he teaches the ideology and mission of the Black Panther Party. A singular event that's never happened before, and is destined to lead the characters away from their status quo. O'Neill has infiltrated Fred Hampton's circle of influence. An examination of what's different in light of the something new, what's the same in spite of it in relation to the status quo. Hampton nurtures the growth of his chapter of the Black Panther Party, while O'Neill struggles with the expectations and discipline of his new role. The discovery that things are less than ideal, or an exploration of how badly things are. It's revealed that O'Neill is an informant for Agent Mitchell, tasked with gathering info on Hampton. Then O'Neill finesses his way closer into the inner circle with an FBI-sponsored whip. Characters dedicate their effort to a specified goal, which is smaller in scope than the primary objective of the third act. Hampton broadens his community outreach and targets other groups and community organizations, while O'Neill negotiates for compensation for his information complicated by it being off the books. A brief checklist of the story elements needed for the second act. The racial motivations and disinformation tactics of the federal government. The tensions and stakes of politics and war. Fred Hampton's oratory talents. And the complications from Bill O'Neill's past. The singular event that launches the characters into the wild jungle of the second act, also called an oh shit moment. Judy holds O'Neill at gunpoint, suspicious of the bacon scent wafting off his clothes. Oh shit. Characters must learn all new rules and expectations distinct to this adventure. O'Neill fumbles through his cover story, ill prepared for such a high stakes interrogation, then must prove his car thief skills to lend credence to his desperate blathering, while Hampton lowers his guard to let someone in ever closer. Characters showcase their ability to grow in the areas this adventure requires, typically through external means. Hampton extends his outreach to white rednecks and finds allies to form a rainbow coalition, while O'Neill enjoys the finer rewards of being a paid informant and Hampton finds blissful escape. Characters face legitimate and understandable reasons to deviate from their stated convictions, agendas, or desires. Hampton is framed for the heinous act of uh, stealing ice cream, which leads to O'Neill's promotion into higher circles of the Black Panther Party, and to the reality of what happens to rats like himself, prompting more vague language and promises from Agent Mitchell. An escalation of problems that vex the characters. Agent Mitchell is clued into a different federal informant altogether, and a sneaky ruse to raid the chapters one by one. Then O'Neill throws off the scent of suspicion by sowing mistrust among the members. Hampton continues his unification efforts in prison, though his letters are all being intercepted. Then Jimmy Palmer is gunned down. Characters evolve internally by utilizing everything they've gathered and learned. The members find ways to stay connected despite police efforts to divide them, and O'Neill runs around like a rat in a maze trying to escape the violence that's brewing. 
journey-weary characters reconcile the reality of their ongoing situation with who they were in the first act. Hampton receives news that everything he's built since Act 1 has been torn down and burned, while O'Neill tries and fails to end his first act deal to be a paid informant, and the greater community adds their effort to rebuilding and unification. A singular event that strikes at the protagonist's core conflict. J. Edgar Hoover brings in Agent Mitchell to a strategy meeting, proving that O'Neill's identity is not protected whatsoever, and there's no turning back from here. Characters find needed answers for both external and internal conflicts. Hoover coyly threatens Agent Mitchell's family, tying his fortunes to the productivity of his paid informant, while O'Neill stares into the mouth of the lion again, deeper in his role than ever. The clarified objective is realized in part or in whole, though it's meaningless without the completion of the primary objective. Hampton bears witness to the community organization and unification under the banner of the Black Panthers, but it's ultimately little more than O'Neill burrowing deeper into the inner circle. An existential conflict that wounds the character's sense of self, worldly identity, or their journey. The unexpected death of Jimmy Palmer shakes everyone back into the reality of the war, and finally cracks the good-natured demeanor of Jake Winters. Then Fred Hampton steps back into his oratory talents by almost literally breathing new life into the party. An undeniable win for the protagonist, typically in direct connection to the rebirth. O'Neill maintains his panther composure under the smirking gaze of Agent Mitchell, and it's all but confirmed for winners that Jimmy Palmer was killed in the hospital. A grand loss directly connected to the character's newfound inability to quit the journey. Hampton finds a poem where Deborah questions her pregnancy and faces the terror of bringing up a child into a society he can't change, while good-natured Winters faces down his imminent execution like the revolutionary Hampton called for all Panthers to become. A thematic freefall tied directly to the heavy price. O'Neill begins to crack from the pressure, fearing his consequences are catching up to him while Hampton faces the question of legacy and consequences wrought by the party members' individual actions, just as O'Neill tries to set him up for escalating the conflicts with C4 and his own words. A singular event that robs the protagonist of seemingly any chance of success. J. Edgar Hoover orders the assassination of Hampton in Mitchell's presence, forcing O'Neill into action. Characters cannot return to their starting personas, and must turn to face the primary objective. Hampton faces the prospect of returning to prison, comforted confidently by Deborah, while Agent Mitchell fishes for endgame information, reminding O'Neill what's hanging over his head from both the FBI and the Panthers. Characters move towards a climax, while utilizing the major swings and sneaky misdirections of the story. At a bar, O'Neill is approached by an informant running his own hustle and his old badge resurfaces to bring everything back around to the start. The final confrontation between the protagonist and the antagonistic force. Party members and community leaders alike come together to strategize how to get Hampton to safety, and in the presence of O'Neill the Federal Rat, Hampton refuses to run, refuses to divert his effort from his mission to the people. The singular event where the protagonist finally confronts their place in the status quo, O'Neill goes through with the poisoning, despite how badly it tears him up inside. The direct aftermath of the climax. Federal officers raid the apartment, and a defenseless Chairman Fred Hampton is assassinated in his sleep. The consequences of the climax in relation to other characters in the status quo. Agent Mitchell hands O'Neill some spending money and a full-time job in exchange for his service to the anti-black authority which O'Neill accepts. A tight focus on the protagonist contrasted from the opening. The real interview of Bill O'Neill plays, who later takes his own life when confronted with the Judas actions from so many years earlier. And there you have it. My 40th example to support my argument that all movies follow the exact same story structure, regardless of how the writer approaches their craft. Judas and the Black Messiah capitalized on the themes and expectations of each sequence, and effortlessly hammers every step of the 29-point story structure, 
but does this tragic biopic follow the same plot beats as the post-prequel prequel that sets up the original trilogy with the cinematic spectacle of the sequel series? Yes. Yes, it arguably does. Next on my docket, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. Please subscribe to stay up to date with this and future videos, and please like and comment with your thoughts and reactions. I'll talk to you next time.